Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road, where my guests today are Bob Hickel and Lee Bracey. Thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Yes. Bob, you got an amazing story of restoration, uh, but much of that took place at the Woodburn Christian Children's Home. And uh, Lee, you're the executive director. You've been there how many years? I've been there 27 years. And you're celebrating your 40th year this year, right? Our 40th anniversary. That's, that's amazing. I'd love for people to hear what you do at the Woodburn uh, Christian Children's Home uh, before we get to Bob's story of restoration. Well, the Woodburn Christian Children's Home is a ministry of Christian churches and churches of Christ, but we're broadly supported by the Christian community throughout the tri-state area. All of our placements are private placements. We believe that God established the family to perform a very special function, to be the principal means of the transmission of godly lifestyle and values to each new generation, and we want to be a part of that. And so we minister to the family. Our placements are private placements made by their family or by their guardians. Uh, all of our funding is private funding as well. We don't take any government funds. Wow. We're able to operate on about half the average of similar child care throughout the tri-state area. And uh, our cost is on a sliding scale according to the parents' ability to pay. We've raised many children who had no ability to pay whatsoever. We have long-term placements and short-term placements. Raised a lot of kids, uh, helped grandpas and grandmas and single moms and parents who are sick and even some who are in prison. Uh, we believe that it's worth the investment of a lifetime. It sure is. And uh, so people understand when you use the word placement, that's the, that's the child coming to you. It is. It happens through relationships. It doesn't necessarily happen, happen through a government agency bringing you somebody. That's true. Uh, many of the placements come through our churches or people who know of the ministry of the children's home. The parents or guardians don't give up guardianship. We work with the family. We're, we work hand in hand with that's them. That's incredible. That is incredible. Well, we got to get to how your paths intersected. Uh, Bobby, I'd like you to give us a little background of your family when you were young, or your earliest memories of that. Sure. I was born in 1973 in Fort Wayne, and um, I came from a, uh, an alcoholic family. Both my parents were alcoholics, extremely bad. And um, it wasn't uncommon to see my parents start drinking early in the morning till sun up to sundown. And that's the environment you knew. Right. You gave me a picture of your dad one time. You said he wore a, a wife beater, drank Pabst Blue Ribbon Bill and unfiltered, a beer in unfiltered Pall Malls. Cigarette, yeah. Is that right? Um, well, it, it's, we can sit here and look back because of your restoration and smile a little bit, but it was a very uh, tense environment. Um, your mom, um, her addiction caused her to do some things that uh, were really traumatic, if you could explain sure. a little bit. Well, my father died in 1983 of alcoholism, and after that, things really, before that, things were pretty bad, but things got, went from bad to awful after that, and, and my mom just went off the deep end and just did some stuff to us kids, and it wasn't uncommon for her to sell us, you know, to people in the neighborhood to get money for her alcohol, and... I just, it's a, it's a traumatic experience for me, but I've just, have learned to, you know, deal with it and overcome it and protect my children from the predators. Well, at what point did you end up walking through the doors of Broadway Church? Well, actually, I didn't walk through. I was carried. Carried through? <laughs> carried through. At seven months old, um, there's a little, there's a little lady, at the, old lady at the time. Um, her name was Bricky Brown. And they had a Broadway Christian Church had a bus ministry that reached into our neighborhood, and um, my mom put us, put myself and my older brother on the bus and said, "Take him to church." And so it was from then on. I I attended Broadway for about 23 and a half years, with the exception for my time at the children's home. We had attended Cedar Creek Church of Christ, but um, yeah, I was affiliated with the church for quite a while. Now your dad. Uh was baptized right before he died, right? Yes, shortly before he died. And you were about 10 years old, 9 or 10? 9, there. 8 or 9. And you were uh, baptized at the same time? Um, shortly after that, yes, after I think, that. or before. Now, when you hear him talk about uh, Broadway Church, don't you think about uh, how the Holy Spirit probably moved in Bob Yalberg or somebody in the church to start that bus ministry? And here we see the, the provision uh, uh, that followed God's vision. You know, you look back and you see how things fit together. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, they ministered so well to Bob and to his sister, Kim. And uh, they were being cared for by families in the church. And families, uh, oftentimes, that that, that's a pretty big job to bring a new child or children into your home. And so, uh, if I recall correctly, the elders suggested that they bring Bob out to the children's home, see how he'd get along. And if he got along okay, bring Kim out too. And that's how we got him. <laughs> and and, it and we have been thankful ever since. We love these two just as we love hundreds of children who well, have come through our door. You have an amazing carrier of the message of restoration here in, in Bobby. Um, Bob, um, there was a, I think, state trooper with a very deep voice. Yes. Men with deep voices seem to follow you around. Yeah. Uh, you remember? Uh, yeah. Tell us about him. Don Smith was a state trooper in a very husky man. He wasn't he was also large, but he just had this deep authoritative voice. And he was, I was fearful of him because he just, he was very authoritative and he carried that with him. And he always would say to me, the first thing you'd say to me before you'd say anything else, you'd say, you being good? And the last thing you'd say to me, he goes, be good. And the, the day, and he always called me Bobby, and the day I got married, um, he had tears in his eyes. He says, well, he says, I guess I can't call you Bob anymore. You're a man now. You got married. And so, <laughs> so for 30 plus years, oh, 30 years, he called me Bobby. Um, so that Broadway uh, church provided you, that atmosphere provided you a little bit of what you were lacking at home, right? Because right. weren't you even uh, going through the dumpsters to eat? Yeah, there was times where we didn't have food to eat. And I remember um, years later, you know, I was at, at this particular McDonald's and, and the lady came inside and it was one of the managers. She said, I just caught some guy digging in the dumpster outside there. And it happened to be that very McDonald's that I did the same thing. Oh my goodness. And and it just brought back some of the horrible memories. And Hence you suppressed that memory yes. up until that point. Yeah, I, I, did, I totally had forgotten about it. Mm-hmm. Totally forgot about it until that moment when she came in and said that. And mm. Well, describe, I, I know the family environment wasn't there for you and the church is filling that void and then they're going to connect you to the uh, children's home. Um, I assume you made some foolish choices along the way. Um, I recall one of them, maybe even with an automobile, if you want to describe yeah, I, that. Yeah, this was, I was probably 10 or 11, and this was obviously before I moved to the children's home. And for whatever reason, I got in my mind, well, let's see what happens if I put a, a lit match down a gas tank of a car. I don't know if, you, if I've ever told you this story, but... I'm learning things all the time, <laughs> not only from you, but from many others. So it was the kind of car that had the license plate that you pulled down and you filled the tank that way. And so I took this lit match, and I, I think it was a wooden match, so I, and I thought it was cool, so I lit it on my zipper, you know, at the time. Oh, yeah. And, so the I, West End. and I threw it down there, and this long flame came out, and I, I was so scared. I thought the car was going to blow up. I never ran so fast in my entire life. It was and, crazy. And so this is the kind of guy you get a few years later. If I had only known that <laughs> when we interviewed him. <laughs> now, at some point, you also learn that you have a learning disability, but it, it might be um, caused a little bit by the uh, trauma in your life. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I was definitely behind in school, and, and the teachers recognized that I needed some extra help, so they put me in some special ed classes. And I think more of it, I do have a learning disability to a degree, but I think more of it was Part of just the interpersonal relationship I had in my family, it, the dynamics of your family, you know, that's how you, if that's all how you learn, you know, I didn't have the um, safe environment and anybody to come alongside me in my particular home. Yeah, like my kids bring their homework home and a lot of times we sit there and I learn a lot of things that I had forgotten and we, and you know, I, we and do I it together and you were having that. that. Um, uh, Lee, can you remember uh, the first time you saw this guy? I can what was that like? He's a scrawny little guy. He was? Yeah, he was. And, but immediately loved. Lots of times I'll tell a boy or girl that I've just met and who are probably coming to the children's home, I love you. I just don't know all the reasons why I love you mm. yet. We use a lot of positive prophecy too, telling them what wonderful things God can do with their lives. Mm. And we've told our children, and they are our children, again and again and again, 
We don't raise victims at the Woodburn Christian Children's Home. We raise overcomers. And Bobby, and I call him that, is an overcomer. He certainly is. Um, can you describe what he was like when he first walked in and maybe some of the, uh, any disciplinary things that you had to deal <laughs> with with Bobby? I, I do recall one time. <laughs> I, re I recall a couple, as a matter of fact. I, re I recall one time I'd been out uh, ministering in the churches, and, and that's a lot of what I do, go out and perform service and tell the story. And that's how we're able to do what we do, is that the, the donations come from people that care. And uh, I was on my way home, and, and uh, Vivian, my wife, called me on the car phone and said, uh, I have Bob here at the house, and I can't remember what he'd done. This would be early, mid-teens? Uh, yeah. Probably 16. Okay. And uh, so I, I knew he was waiting for me. And I came in the door, and the first words out of his mouth were, Boy, Mr. Bracey, I'll bet I feel almost as badly as if you'd actually disciplined me for what I did. <laughs> He, he was, all, disability. He was always so. quick. I don't think <laughs> I that there's any real learning disability uh -huh. there. And my reply to it was, well, Bob, we're going to get a chance to compare. <laughs> did you ever, like, right when you're going to bed at night and you got that time alone to yourself, your thoughts before you go to sleep, did you ever find yourself kind of saying, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm not there, I'm glad I'm here, or... God, why am I here? Uh, why, why, did you look at God as maybe blaming him for the circumstances you were in? What was like your perspective at that time? I mean, sure, we, I had those thoughts, you know, but I always knew that um, God had his best interest at heart for me. And I knew that I was definitely loved from the moment I was interviewed before I was placed at the children's home. You know, I remember sitting in the living room and, and we were talking and I remember the one of the first questions that Lee asked me, he said, Are, he said, in order to come here at the, to the children's home, you have to be a willing participant to be here. He said, are you willing to, to be willing? And I, and I said, sure. And I remember that to this day. And uh, Lee, describe what you meant by that. Well, I, I still say basically the same thing. When a, when a boy or girl comes for that placement interview, I'll tell them two things to begin with. I'll tell them if all things are as they should be, the Woodburn Christian Children's Home is a good place for them, but it's not the best place for them. Mm. The best place for a boy or girl, if everything is as it should be, is home. Mm -hmm. Honoring and obeying their mother and father. Now, they're not ready for that. Yeah. They don't want to hear that. The second thing I tell them is to relax. No one's going to make you come here. And they kind of mm. look at me, and I thought that's what this was all about. And I say, no, there are places where you have to go. They've got locks and fences, and people walk single file from place to place. This is the place that you get to go mm. if you've got enough of what it takes to grab hold of an opportunity. Mm. That's powerful. I love how you cast vision because I, I think so many, even uh, kids that seem to have it all going for them, I think they need that, that godly kingdom vision for their lives and, and bring purpose to their uh, days so that their little steps can match up with the journey that God's got, that destination Agreed. down there, or the, which is the journey with him. Um, I just love how you do that. So how, how long were you at the children's home? I was there from 15 until... About 18 and a half, I graduated from high school. And, you know, when I went there, I was definitely, um, I wasn't a bad kid. You know, I was, I describe it as a, a kid at risk of, I was just on that threshold of going down the wrong path. And had I, I, I can firmly tell you and believe, had I not gone there and other people in my life, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation mm -hmm. today. I would be on the other side of, of the bob wired fence per se in jail or prison or maybe even dead so i'm just so grateful for what god's people has done for me in my life so i was there roughly almost four years and i was the first one of my immediate family to graduate from high school that that was our that was one of our big goals yeah, it was. then then after i did that i was an 18 year old kid sitting in in driver's ed class with a bunch of 15 and 16 year old kids getting laughed at, you know, thinking, why are you, you're 18. But the goal was for me to graduate from high school, get that accomplished first, then get the driver's license. So authority and responsibility can equal.
right? That's right. Uh, so you got your driver's license, I assume? Yes. <laughs> and yeah. then what did you do for a vocation? I um, went to Ivy Tech for about a semester, and I worked at the same time. Uh -huh. But prior to, to moving out of the children's home, getting on my own in L.A., I had, I had, several, I had two jobs, two part-time jobs, and I saved all my money. You know, I bought my, I bought my own car, you know, and they, and they helped me, you know, do that. And, and my house parents at the time, Dave and Kendra Smith, they're still there. They've been there 20 years now. 22 years. 22 years. And Dave taught me how to drive. And if you ever try to teach somebody how to drive on country roads, gravel roads, uh -huh. you know, I, would, I, would, I just couldn't master turning the corner slow. You know, I just, I went around the corner and Dave would say, Bob, four wheels, four wheels, four wheels, not two, not two. <laughs> I thought maybe I was Bo Duke or something. From the oh, Dukes of oh yeah, that's the way I learned to drive. I know exactly what you're saying, that loose feel. Um, now you're the greatest pool guy in the world, right? Were you, were you runner up in the contest? Yeah, last year um, they had a national contest mm -hmm. for the perfect pool guy and pool gal. And I entered that contest and I had several people vote for me more than several they didn't say how many but I made it to the top five in the nation and I got I got this really cool plaque that says perfect pool guy pleat co contest make top five or something like that so it was that was pretty cool that is really cool and you are you are a very good pool guy yeah um, I'm the legend you are the uh, <laughs> um, you make me think about when you first got uh, we're getting going um, out of out of the home uh, I think there was a rent payment that you miss and you thought well, you'd go to somebody for I help? I think actually what had happened is I bought these shoes, these Michael Jordan shoes, they were suede, they were... They were <laughs> what color suede? They were black and they had, they were, they were, the, they were bad. <laughs> they, they were, they were cool. They were, they were up like they had the high tops, they had the Velcro, it was, uh -huh. they were cool, but they were $150. Oh, they were a lot and of money. So um, I got a speeding ticket after I bought these shoes, and so it made me short for my rent because I had to, I had to pay the speeding ticket, and so instead of paying the speeding ticket, I bought these shoes, and so it made me short for my rent, and and so I, I so I called Lee and said this I, I I'm short for my rent, and I explained to him why, and he I said is there is there anything you can help me with and, or do, and he said well come out we'll talk. So I came out, and I, matter of fact, they were had they had a board meeting that night. Yeah, I remember now. You remember that? Yeah. And so, the board members were there. And so I walk in, and Lee said, "Okay, why don't you sit right here in the middle of the floor, in front of everybody?" And, and, and not on the floor, in well, a chair. Or in a chair, <laughs> in a chair. <laughs> they didn't make me sit on the floor, but I was. I I, I sat in a chair, and I and I had to explain to everybody what had happened. And it was embarrassing and humbling at the same time. And, and they all said, okay. And, and Lee said, well, he said, we talked about it before you came out. We want to help you. But he said, we need something in collateral. I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, well, maybe they're going to want my car or something or this or that. And, and I, he said, no, you need that to get to work. He said, we, we, I want your shoes. My Michael Jordan Velcro black suede. Yeah, my Michael Jordan <laughs> shoes. So... They weren't as impressive to me as they were to him. <laughs> I don't think they so, were. <laughs> so I gave him my shoes and I drove home in my stocking feet that night. And you've never forgotten it. I never forgot it. Now and he Lee, got his shoes back. He yeah. did? So yeah. he did yeah. earn the yeah. money, paid it back? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, Lee, you, you, you make that decision and the board makes that decision because they're seeing somebody that needs help with their priorities, right? Oh, we talked about it before he got there. We had smiles on our faces. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we had a chance to teach uh, an, an appropriate lesson, an, an appropriate consequence. Yeah, and I mean, you'll never forget it, will you? No. And it probably helped a lot with uh, priorities and responsibility, right. don't you think? And that was, I've been a part of the ministry at the Children's Home for nearly 25 years, but that was 20 years ago mm -hmm. that, that, that that took place. Well, talk about that, because um, when somebody's restored, I think God uses that person to bring restoration to others. And you've never left your connection, really, to the children's home. Talk about what you've done in the last 20 years and what it means to you. It's my, first of all, it's my home. You know, always will be. And I don't 
feel sorry for myself that I lived there. I, I wear it with a badge of honor that I had the opportunity to, to live there. You know, they, they gave me a home when, when I needed it. And over the past 25 years or 20 years, you know, I've been involved in different ways. You know, um, before I was married, I would go out. I tried to go out once a month, you know, and spend time with the kids out there to give them an example of, of what can transpire in their lives. You know, just because you live in a children's home, you don't, you don't have to feel sorry for yourself. You can rise above that and be restored and use that to glorify God. And since I've been married, <clears throat> my wife and I and family have subbed as house parents out there on a couple occasions over the weekend. And, and, it, and doing that from a different perspective, you know, to see the kids there now and to see the kind of stuff they, they try to, you know, pull over your, over your eyes. I'm thinking, you know what? I've been around. I've been here. I know what the rules are. <laughs> you know, we try not to call them substitute house parents. We call them guest house parents because of what kids do to substitute teachers. <laughs> they still do the same thing, right. but it makes us feel better to call them guests. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, talk about, you, you mentioned your family. Talk about how you met your wife. I met my wife on a blind date. Who, who set that up? A friend of mine from, from the church I was going to at the time. One of my best friends, his wife set us up. And... Um, we met, it was a February, we got a real bad winter storm. And I'm thinking, great, you know, I'm supposed to have this blind date with this, with this girl. And, you know, we got all the snow. I'm thinking it's going to get canceled. And, but we went out and had a great time. And I, I only had known her three weeks, and I told her we were going to get married. And she kind of looked at me like, You're, what? And we did. So. And how long have you been married? Um, since 2004. So going on nine years, I guess, now. Yeah. And who, who officiated that service? Well, I called Lee yeah. and asked him if he would do that, and he, he graciously agreed to. And during one of the funniest moments in the ceremony, I don't know if you remember this or not, it was towards the end, um, you repeat your vows, and, and it was my wife's turn. And, and, you know, and then after she got done with her vows, you know, the pastor says, and therefore, by the power vesting me up, and now I'll pronounce your man and wife. And my wife repeated that. <laughs> remember that? No, but it's coming back to me now. <laughs> she, she was just so she was just so nervous. Oh, that's it, awesome. it was it was funny, and she 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 was just kind of embarrassed. She, she grabbed my arm. She was trying to leave. He goes he goes wait wait wait. We're not done. We're not done. <laughs> Forgive me for not remembering it. I'm getting really old, Bob. <laughs> but one thing I do remember that that Lee said at our ceremony. He said April. He said he said we haven't known you long, but we we love you because we love Bob, yeah. and that made a great, great deal to me. Now, um, how many children do you have? Five. Five, and she had? She had two, two. girls from a previous, previous relationship, and after we got married, I adopted the, the two, our two oldest girls. See, I think that's so powerful, because didn't their father leave them? Yes. Um, I just, uh, the Bible talks about how we're adopted into God's family, and when, when you hear your story, and that you are an overcomer, that you are a victor, not a victim. Right. Um, this is such a picture of that when you're adopting two people uh, who need a dad, who need a father. And I think it's such a picture of, of God being the father to the fatherless and how that's happened in your life. But sure. you've had a, a tremendous role model here, but you also had a church family that, that came around you at an early age to give you a foundation, so uh, right. roots to return to. Um, but growing up, you really liked the story of Esther. And, yes. and there's a reason I'd like you to share well, that. The, the first time I came and encountered with the story of Esther was, was at the children's home. We, we would have family Bible studies together. It was usually in the, during the school year, the winter months, things kind of slow down. And, and so we always would have, it was on Tuesday nights. It was over at Lee and Vivian's house. We, all the kids would come together. We all would sit on the floor, the couches or whatever, and just, and just have a Bible study. And one of the topics we studied was Esther. And the reason it, it sticks into my head is King Xerxes. Um, Lee would say King Xerox, or, <laughs> or Dave would say King Xerxes, and, and, or Xerox, and, and the kids would say, no, it's King Xerxes. And so, and, and he did that on, just to, right. on purpose, just to, you know, you know it's a teaching tool. But I like the story of Esther 
because her situation is a little bit similar to mine. She came from, basically she was orphaned and she was taken in by her uncle and then God miraculously used her to help change the kingdom. And years later, I've always loved that story. And years later, you know, a guy was teaching from that story at, a, at my church. And he said, why did God choose this little Jewish girl of all people? Why did things happen in her life the way they did? And he said, the reason they did is because God arranged it that way. Mm. And everything that's happened in my life is because God has arranged it that way. And I want to be an example to other people, you know, but especially to the kids at the children's home, to be an example to them and so they can grow up and have the same outlook that I do, by the grace of God. Amen. Bobby, thank you for being with us. Sure. Lee, thank you for your ministry. My pleasure. I, you, I'm sure you could retell this story uh, tens and twenties and thirties and forties of times because of all the people you've invested in. And it's just a privilege to have you in our community. Thank you very much. Wherever you are today, no matter how bad it is, I want you to realize that there's hope. And that hope is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is our hope. And hope isn't wishful thinking like, I wish things would get better. But hope is a confident assurance. That's what the biblical writers meant when they wrote the word hope, a confident assurance, one that you could be 100% sure that you can be new, that things can be transformed in your life because your heart will be changed and your heart will be transformed, and life will change from the inside out, and then God will use you to bring his restoration to others through the word of God, the people of God, and the spirit of God. You can be new. And so I invite you today to draw a line in the sand, put a stake in the ground, and fully surrender your heart and life to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and begin the restoration process today. He will make you new. He will change you. He will use you to bring his restoration to others. And this is the business that needs to take place first. You don't have to get cleaned up to come to Christ. You have to come to Christ to get cleaned up. If you prayed to him, God, I can't, you can. I can't pay for the penalty, the power of my sin. God in Christ, you can. I can't free myself from the power of sin. God in Christ, you can. We want you to go to our website, therestorationroad.com, and share your story with us and be a carrier of that message. Thank you for being with us.